So we've had a really fascinating day uh, talking about the whole breadth of concerns and, uh, and possibilities, exciting possibilities around research from uh, the BRAIN initiative, which Francis Collins was just talking about, uh, new potential around gene editing to address uh, very important conditions, particularly mental health conditions. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the desperate need for innovation in medical research to really harness the tools we have available now through digital and other methodologies, accelerate innovation, collaborate more, uh, break up the silos around data and information sharing and, and harness uh, uh, in a collaborative way all the possibilities that will emerge from shared data as we saw during the Human Genome Project. And uh, lots of areas of unmet medical need where these kinds of uh, combinations and collaborations could be so important in advancing and accelerating progress. So lots of exciting things already to talk about, and I know we'll delve now into about 20 minutes of conversation among ourselves on those topics before we do uh, take some of the questions. Uh, that, as Mike said, please do avail yourself of the chance to pen us a few words and send a question our way. So just for starters, big picture, as Mike said, HHS, huge agency, huge department, $1.3 trillion of resources, I think you were saying a few moments ago. Uh, where is research and evidence on the agenda from your perspective right now at HHS across all of the agencies uh, that, uh, is our, that make up the department? Yeah, so uh, Susan, thank you, and uh, really glad to be with all of you today. Can you hear me okay? All good? Um, so we're a science and evidence agency. Uh, in fact, I venture to guess we're probably the largest science and evidence agency on the face of the planet. We have the largest biomedical research institution on Earth. Dr. Collins was just here. We have the premier epidemiological organization on Earth, uh, the premier drug and food regulatory agency on Earth, the largest insurance companies on Earth. Um, I feel like a Texan. I'm like, you know, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest. Well, we're right. We are. The, it is that. Uh, and so research is just fundamental to everything that we do, generating data and evidence and making that common domain so that others can build upon that. Uh, so the, whether it's the great work at NIH, providing uh, the foundational primary research that others can build upon to bring therapies or new treatments to market, or if it's CDC, providing the evidence base through our state public health agencies and epidemiological data that can really help us, like with the opioid crisis, uh, know where we need to be aiming. Uh, so because you can't, you can't very well solve a problem if you don't have the data to, to understand fully the source of the problems or ARC providing us health economic and quality data. Uh, just go through the just go through the list. Really, almost every one, every one of our organizations about science, evidence, and data. Even CMS, which you might think of as, of course, primarily about financing health care, is the generator of the largest source of data on Earth, the CMS claims data, which we'll talk about in a bit, I'm sure. How do we make that more available? So front and center across everything uh, that you're engaged in at the moment. Well, let's drill down a little bit on some of the potential for accelerating innovation. And one of the big examples of that is underway now under the auspices of NIH. It's the All of Us yep. Initiative, which of course is the attempt to bring at least a million, if not many more than a million people into a brand new research enterprise to pool their genetic and health related data and to essentially use that, to harness uh, the, the, uh, the utility of that data to make innovations across an entire, potentially an entire range of conditions uh, and diseases. Um, how is that going at this point? As of the first of the year, I think 10,000 people were signed up. Uh, what do you, and what do you see beyond that as the potential for taking those new tools and approaches of all of us and extending them more broadly across the federal research enterprise. So uh, the All of Us initiative at NIH that I don't know if Dr. Collins spoke much about it, but it uh, it's really going to be one of the most historic legacies of, of this decade is getting that initiated. Uh, just think about the impact of the Framingham study. And this puts that to shame in, in size. I mean, a million people enrolled with the benefit of genetic information. Um, we already have 100,000 enrolled. 
Uh, so we're moving at a very fast pace. There's a lot of excitement about it. We are fully represented in terms of a diverse, uh, a diverse study group in there. Uh, it's going to be so large that it will actually allow us to use appropriate statistical methodology to correct for um, any uh, underrepresentation also. So it's very exciting what we're going to be able to learn out of this uh, once we get it fully up and running. We actually next week will be giving, uh, you heard it here first, we'll be giving out $20 million of grants to 40 community health center uh, community health centers that are assisting in enrolling patients to, again, make sure that we're getting a fully representative uh, patient group into the All of Us study. Uh, so it's one of those where it's not, is it going to yield something tomorrow? No. But generations from now, I think they'll be praising Congress, praising the, the leadership at NIH and others for having the foresight to get this started because I can't even imagine what we will learn. It's, 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 it's one of those things where uh, it's going to take us where it takes us, and the potential is so unlimited, I couldn't even venture to guess what it'll be at this point. And the trial will be using a whole lot of innovative technologies, yep. apps, for example, so people can be regularly reporting in as exactly. well as viewing their data. Yep. Yep. Uh, you mentioned diversity and the fact that the a diverse population already is being enrolled. Uh, it's, that's obviously critically mm -hmm. important, and we heard a lot of discussion earlier today about that. Obviously, enlisting community health centers in that could be very important, but various communities are not going to just want statistical, uh, statistical correction, right, right. to account mm -hmm. for diversity. They really want to be represented. So what can we as a nation do to make sure that they are represented in this trial? Well, so far, from what uh, Dr. Collins has told me, we are getting that representation. Uh, we have the cap but it'll be so large, we actually have the capability over time that as demographics change in the United States over what could be a multi-generational process here, that we'll be able to actually make corrections over time from that longitudinal population set, which is, makes it a very exciting proposition. Uh, we have, as part of the outreach that NIH and the rest of HHS did on all of us, uh, it did involve outreach to just trusted intermediaries because, of course, for many communities, handing over your data, your healthcare data, to an agency of the government could, you know, that's a trust barrier, perhaps. And so trusted inter intermediaries, whether social organizations, community organizations, church organizations, others that essentially vouch for and help with enrollment has been critical. And that's why I think NIH has been so successful with the first tenth of, uh, of the population we're getting in so far. So what's the potential for springboarding from those techniques utilized in all of us to other aspects of federally funded research? Well, I think you see that in just what Francis was talking about earlier, the brain initiative. Uh, I think we're trying to harness the just the large numbers and power of big data that uh, that we can bring to bear at the national level. And uh, this is just it's one example, but it's a it's a really big example, uh, but one example of that. Great. So you enunciated four pillars mm -hmm. of your concerns as secretary, and one of the most important ones was addressing the opioid crisis. So let's talk about research and innovation addressing that. Yeah. This came up a little bit earlier in the panel that Dr. Redfield was a member of, where we talked about uh, the need to continually harness data in a very, very timely way to understand what is the state of the epidemic, uh, what is happening with respect to overdoses. We know we had 75,000 deaths from overdoses last year. How do we take the capabilities that the federal government and other partners have now to bring the tools of research to bear uh, most prominently on this crisis. Yeah, so we've been enhancing our data capabilities, and I don't know how much Dr. Redfield got into this, but one of them is our public health reporting and mortality data reporting. So at, uh, at CDC, we had a fairly significant lag of reporting data on, on opioid and other substance, substance use disorder mortality. And we've been able to compress those timelines in and we're now at about a six-month lag on a rolling 12-month basis on getting, getting that mortality data in. And one of the things we want to get that even faster, I'd like to get closer to you know, almost real-time month, two-month data lags. In addition, we've spread our reporting to all states uh, through the help of the bipartisan omnibus package that we got through, this, got through the Congress uh, with over $4 billion of funding for 2018 alone. That allowed us to expand our reporting in, working with state and local partners, public health departments. Um, in addition, what we 
one of the biggest challenges we have are the imputed deaths from opioids because, of course, when somebody dies, it, we just don't always get an accurate representation of the cause of death. And so you can, but we have various algorithms that allow us to extrapolate from the core data set out to the probabilized opioid deaths out of that. And just further refining those algorithms, refining the quality of data that comes in helps us a great deal. Then, of course, we have the non-data side, the, the innovation discovery side. We've got $1.1 billion that we funded at NIH through that, that bipartisan Omni package. And at NIH, we've got research going into what's the next generation of non-opioid pain care, uh, that, you know, what would be pharmaceutical in innovations and interventions that we might be able to have that are non-opioid for pain. Because, of course, we, we have a pain problem that we have to deal with. Uh, what is the research into non-pharmacological non interventions for pain? Getting the evidence base around other tactics like um, you know, massage or uh, acupuncture, just all the other types of ways of pain management that are thought of. Can we build the appropriate evidence base around that to see what works and what doesn't work as alternatives? How do we guide physical therapy? For physical therapy, build the evidence base around all of that. Uh, then we're also doing, we've launched a study now on neonatal abstinence syndrome because a very novel syndrome for how do you care for the babies that are born opioid addicted. Um, we've, we've got many major centers. I was just out at Nationwide Children's in Columbus, Ohio with the First Lady where they've been one of the leaders in developing the techniques of helping these babies as they're born. Uh, there's really not yet a clear clinical pathway on what to do. So we've got a study to work to build that evidence base for, for practitioners out there. And what about treatment for yeah. addiction? Yeah. So we're firm believers in medication-assisted therapy. Uh, from almost day one, I've made that clear that, that the administration supports MAT. It's the evidence base. It is certainly the evidence-based approach to treatment and recovery. Uh, we support whatever works for, you know, for individuals to get them into a state of recovery, but MAT we know, we know works. And we've been working at FDA. We put out guidances to speed up the approval of new MATs. We've uh, put out guidance of modified endpoints uh, in addition to simply preventing overdose and death. Also, uh, surrogate uh, biomarkers and uh, surrogate endpoints for the approval of new MAT, ther MAT therapies there. Uh, we are working with our state and local partners through our response grants to ensure the state targeted response grants, uh, which we're putting out soon, the next tranche of them, to ensure that MAT is fully supported there. We have a huge shortage of treatment providers yep. in this country and been co some considerable reluctance among a lot of physicians and others to undergo the training to provide medication-assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. What kinds of innovation strategies can be brought to bear on that problem? So uh, one of the core objectives we have is in our opioids initiative being led out of HRSA, the, the Health Resources Services Administration, which is so invested in training health professionals, is how can we train up uh, a whole new generation in the next several years of mental health providers who can be focused on substance use disorder as well as mental health. So for us at the department and the administration, a major priority is, is building up a whole coterie of mental health providers that can be there to provide MAT, uh, to provide proper counseling and care for the comorbid conditions of mental health that are associated with substance use disorder also. And you've said some things in the past about being very excited about the possibilities of telehealth and telemedicine. Yeah. Could we extend approaches to treatment on that basis in as fact, well? We, well? In fact, we're doing so. So many Americans live in rural communities and they're suffering from the opioid epidemic and they may not have access to MAT, they may not have access to, to core mental health and substance use uh, providers in their area. And so what we've done through SAMHSA is actually uh, um, make apps available and other telehealth provisions available where an individual can be in their in their rural community and still have access. So that's so we're, I'm a huge believer in telehealth. How can we expand that fully uh, to make sure that we have equal access in rural communities as well as or, you know more urban zip codes? And op the op opioid care is certainly a critical part of that. In addition to I think we've got 150 million dollars out of HRSA that for rural health provision around opioid addiction also. Let's move on to another of your pillars, which is lowering drug prices. And we have a lot of our friends from the biopharma community in the room who, I spent, recognize a couple. who spent the better part of their summer responding to the... I like I'm at a board meeting. 
Well, these folks, thank you for giving them a summer uh, reading assignment, which was to read through all the questions in the blueprint, request for information, and right. to respond to that. Uh, seriously, uh, this is a big, big task yeah. uh, ahead to figure out how to get our arms around this issue. But very importantly, to understand the relationship between pricing and innovation yeah. and thinking through how we can do what some people think is the impossible, which is actually lower drug prices, but spur biomedical innovation, biopharmaceutical innovation at the same time. Give us your thoughts on that. So uh, obviously the president and I are very focused on, in, uh, on retaining the incentives for innovation here in the United States. We are, I've said this before, Repeatedly, I do believe we are at the cusp of a golden age in terms of innovation in biopharmaceuticals here in the United States and in the world as the great work of Dr. Collins from Decoding the Human Genome now comes to fruition 15, 16 years later with that greater understanding of the molecular nature of disease and the greater targeted, the, the more validated targeting of precise molecules, monoclonal antibodies, for instance, against those targets. Um, we have so much potential that's currently coming off the development uh, pipelines and being made real for patients right now, genuine cures for some of the most important diseases now and that are coming. Uh, so we, we want to foster that. We want to support that. But the current pricing structure is unsustainable and will not remain. And what I say to everybody, whether they're in the drug industry, the PBM industry, the wholesaler industry, the pharmacy industry, is it is going to change. Uh, and I liken it to uh, one of my favorite uh, books is uh, The Leopard. And in this book, the, uh, uh, there's, an, there's an Italian aristocrat, and his, I think it's his nephew, is, gives him some advice about, as the world is changing and Italy is going to become a republic, says to him, the more we want things to remain the same, the more we have to change. And I would say for everybody in the pharmaceutical channel, drug pricing and the drug channel are going to change. Um, you need to change with that your business practices, and there will be an innovative, flourishing world that comes out of that change, but you will have to adapt to that. Resisting it is not going to happen because the other solutions will not be competitive, they won't be free market, and they won't support innovation. So we need your help. We need the ideas, we need your help because we want to create that ecosystem. The alternatives will not. And all I can tell you that's for certain is the status quo will not remain under whether it's under my leadership and the president's leadership or somebody else's, the status quo will not remain. And we've laid out a bold agenda to change that. I think it is very doable. I think that we can reduce list prices. The list prices are completely artificial today. There is no reason for them except for every financial incentive in the system at every part of the channel being towards higher list prices. So our job is to reverse those incentives to get list prices. That doesn't impact innovation because that isn't being yielded by innovators, it's just an artificiality in the system that goes into the gross to net, the difference between list price and actual net realized price. We need to compress that, create the incentives to make that happen. Uh, we need to get better deals for parts of our program. Uh, we are tired of paying list price, in fact, list price plus 6% markup in the Part B drug program of infusion drugs. Uh, we are going to get negotiations and we're going to get discounts there and we're going to have a more normalized system there. We have to figure out how to do that in a pro-patient, patient-centric, practice-centric way, but we're going to get there. We need to make sure in the Part D drug program that we have full negotiation. We have hamstrung the PBMs too much there. We need to give them more power to negotiate in certain areas where we're not getting good enough deals for our patients. But again, doing it all in that kind of a construct, creating more competition. You know, Dr. Gottlieb's done historic things at, at, at FDA, historic level of generic drug approvals last year, the highest level of generic approvals in June ever in history. And we need to create a clear pathway for biosimilars. Our goal has to be eventually interchangeable biosimilars so that we can get that same future state there in biosimilars that we have in generics. So just some of the things we need to be doing on drug pricing, but the world is going to change and be part of that. As Gretzky would say, skate to where the puck is going, reform your business practices now, get there and be part of that solution, or you can resist it, but it's coming anyways, one way or the other. And just a, a follow-up, what do you think the federal government can do to enhance the innovation piece that you addressed briefly in terms of drug discovery and drug development? 
Well, uh, obviously, the work that NIH does is, is so critical. I think what, what, we, what we can do best at NIH, of course, is doing the research that it doesn't make sense for any one company to fund individually, and it becomes a common good, especially where we can develop validated targets. Because so much of drug development nowadays is um, if you can place your money against a validated target, the question then doesn't become so much um, the old, you know, the old world d drug development was you invent a bunch of molecules, you throw them against the wall, and you see what sticks much more of an empirical approach. We've moved now to a much more deductive approach to drug development, where if you have an actual validated target you need to act against, you can design a monoclonal antibody, to, as an example, to act against that target, whether receptor or otherwise. You know it's going to work. It's just a question, does it work too much? Do you get off-target effect, something, you know, safety, otherwise? That's a huge advance from where we were 15 years ago in small molecule empirical based drug development. That, that increases your yield in phase three. Um, it reduces dr drug development costs. It will speed up drug, drug delivery. Um, so we need to do that foundational work. Can we validate those targets? Pain. Okay. Can we at NIH, through the opioid initiative, develop what the pain targets are? Can we develop new novel targets for depression, for instance, for mental health, so that we can start seeing we need more discovery and development in, in, in mental health? Can we develop those targets so others then can devote the hundreds and millions of millions of dollars of clinical trial work against that to bring products to market? Great. Let's move to a brief discussion about use of data, including, for example, all the data you mentioned earlier collected by CMS and others, and how we can make greater use of that in the research uh, process. And uh, let me just signal that if we have cards ready to come up to, so we can move to questions, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and take those now. But yep. tell us, uh, you just this year, for example, you've uh, announced uh, availability now of the Medicare Advantage yep, data for ever. the first time. Mm -hmm. Build from there, what else is in train? So uh, you have in me somebody who is a huge believer in the power of big data and predictive analytics applied against that. I've done that in the private sector. I'm committed to it in the public sector. Uh, you have in the leadership of HHS a similar level of commitment. Uh, Dr. Collins, Administrator Burma, our Chief Technology Officer, and I spent a great deal of time on this. Uh, as, as Susan said, we've made Medicare Advantage um, uh, claims data available now for research for the first time ever next year. Our Medicaid claims data and our S-CHIP, uh, State Children's Health Insurance Program data, will be available. Uh, I am working on programs. My ultimate goal is I want to get all of that information available, accessible for researchers, and frankly, even I, you know, within appropriate protections for commercial research against uh, and biomedical research against all of this data. Uh, this should not, in the modern cloud-based data aggregation environment, we ought to be able to do this, and I think do it without tremendous expense and without tremendous time lag. Uh, so I, I think that could also, along with all of us, be one of our major legacies for the future of innovation and human health is having that pool of data just be available and let it take us where it takes us. Of course, with appropriate, we have to steer through the privacy protections to make sure that, it, that it's all done appropriately. But uh, uh, I've got a big commitment to make that happen. Great. All right, well, we've got a big load of questions that came in from the audience, so let's try to get through some of them. So this questioner writes, we truly appreciate that patient empowerment features so prominently in your priorities at HHS. In that context, do you support reauthorization of PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which of course will need to be reauthorized uh, next year. I believe it's next year, correct? Um, yeah. So we, uh, uh, any of you who've been in administrations know that uh, you, uh, when you're in these jobs, you can't actually say support for legislation or not, because otherwise the, the Office of Management and Budget has to approve everything one says about actual legislation. Of course, um, uh, with, with PCORI and other research institutions that we have around providing health economics, around providing, I'm providing, like we have at ARC, the critical information that we have that we can generate there around health system reform. You know, the work we're doing at ARC is really terrific. We've invested, so many people want to think about, say, compare drug comparative effectiveness, but there's so much of, that we could do around health system reform. And that's where ARC has been doing great work, um, just providing best practices, best evidence around ways we can deliver care better, more efficiently, higher quality, more value-based. Uh, and so as we look at PCORI, that's, that'd be the kind of directions I'd be looking for. 
the scuttlebutt is that you have also been a defender of ARC within an administration that has proposed zeroing out ARC. Is that still your position? Uh, ARC, for, well, of course, uh, anything we provide in the budget, I, I will support. But while ARC is with us, I will highly value it and support it and use it fully. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> is that helpful? That, enough said. Enough said. I think we get the drift. Okay. So here's another question about uh, that really bears on an earlier conversation we had uh, in this room about antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. What is the most important step the nation can take from a policy perspective to address the resistance compromised antibiotic supply with so few companies developing new antibiotics? So in fact, in a couple of weeks, I'll be at the UN General Assembly where we have a high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance. It's also a track uh, for the G20 meeting that we have in Argentina coming up. So the, the, world, the world health ministerial leaders are very focused on AMR. Um, <clears throat> we're of course investing in that quite heavily at NIH uh, to provide what, again, as we talked about before on the discovery and development side of things, what can we provide by way of new targets and evidence base for next generation um, antibiotics. Uh, then, of course, there's the practice of medicine changes, which, as I look at opioids and the practice of medicine and opi and on pain, it makes me a bit optimistic, frankly, because I've, I've seen firsthand the changes that have happened by culturally in the medical profession around the writing of antibiotics. We've seen this. I think we can use those same tactics of changing a culture around writing of the legal opioids, just the automatic go-to over-prescribing, over-writing, over-dispensing on opioids. So I think some of those same tactics will work there. But I think those are the two key legs of AMR. Okay, great. So we just got time probably for one, maybe two more quick questions. This questioner writes, I know regulatory reform is a priority for the administration. Federally funded researchers currently spend more than 40% of their time on administrative tasks. Tasks, excuse me. What are your priorities for addressing this issue? Well, first, I'm going to be asking Dr. Collins if that 40% number is right. <laughs> Um, if it is, that's a problem. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, that should not be happening. I think it's With our $38 a, billion, dollars, we can't waste 40% of it on filling out forms and administrative work. I, I, I don't know if that's the case, but I'm going to ask him. Okay, and here's a final question, I think. What role do you see for the National Institute on Drug Abuse in terms of helping to ensure that more medicines enter the drug development pipeline? Well, NIDA, I actually spend a great deal of time with our leadership at NIDA, given the opioid crisis and the critical work that they're playing there, and they're leading so much of our efforts, the public-private partnership around developing uh, next-generation pain medicines, um, just the evidence base around opioid misuse that we have, leading the efforts on NAS, for instance. So um, NIDA is quite critical. In a way that when I was here 12 years ago, I really didn't interact with NIDA much. Now. It's central to so much of everything I do as secretary. Great. All right. Well, unfortunately, those of you who pen these other questions, I apologize that we are out of time. Let me just give you 15 seconds maybe to tell us what you hope your greatest legacy will be in this position vis-a-vis -vis the federal research enterprise. Well, overall, I mean, what I want my legacy to be is I made our programs run better for the American people. Uh, so, you know, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, S-CHIP, NIH and drug development, discovery, drug approvals, I want them to work better and deliver better for the American people and leave the place better than when I got there. That's, that's the legacy I want. Well, I have to say you ran this program very well today. So thanks very much, Alex, for being with us and having a great conversation.